I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid. The world has a hundred questions I can play with. So I'll open my arms and eyes and wonder every day till the day I die. No one really knows my gravity. Our speaker today is Dr. Norman Yao. He is Assistant Professor of Physics <clears throat> at UC Berkeley. He runs the Yao Group and Laboratory, doing research at the interface of five branches of physics. Atomic physics, molecular physics, optical physics, condensed matter physics, and quantum information science, perhaps most relevant today. Back in 2009, Norm received his bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics summa cum laude from Harvard University. His work earned the Radcliffe Institute's Captain Jonathan Fay Prize for, and I quote, partially quote, imaginative and original research, unquote. Norm remained at Harvard earning a PhD in physics in 2014. Later that same year, now as Dr. Yao, he came to UC Berkeley as a postdoctoral Miller Fellow. A short time later, in 2015, before actually joining the faculty at Cal, Dr. Yao received the Outstanding Thesis Award from the Atomic, Optical, and Molecular Physics Division of the American Physical Society. Then, in the summer of 2016, he was appointed Assistant Professor at UC Berkeley. I hope you will give a warm welcome to a man from Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> Not a coincidence, I believe the town was named after him. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Norman Yao. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tucker, for letting me be a, a part of this amazing, amazing program. And uh, it's certainly going to be hard to follow Thomas's very, very poetic introduction to the nuances of radiation. I'd also like to thank all of you, really, for being here, for going to the street fair to hear about quantum computers today. So I see a lot of people in the back. If someone can't hear me, just let me know. So just, just yell out and, and ask a question. And for everyone, I really want this to be interactive. I hope people really take away some feeling, some intuition for what these words, quantum computers, mean in some very, very sort of literal sense. So the tale that I'll tell about a little bit today is, is more of a progress report on the field than anything else. And I think the most important thing is that I would say it's a tale of cautious optimism. I think that if we look around at sort of many of the headlines that we're seeing today, caution has more or less been thrown to the wind, but I hope to bring some of that caution back, but also to inject a deep sense of optimism and interest in sort of where this field is going to develop. I hope to answer three questions within the confines of this talk. The first is, what exactly are quantum computers useful for? The second is, how and why can a quantum computer outperform one's laptop, for example? And the final is, what exactly are the physical systems that one is using to make quantum computers in the laboratory at the moment? Well, let's begin. So, we'll start with a little bit of cold water, but, you know, if you've been following the news lately, especially in the Bay Area, I would say, it turns out that 2018 is the, is the year where headlines are putting together the words quantum computer and here. Every headline seeing that serious quantum computers are finally here. The era of quantum computing is here. And my favorite, here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> so you might think, wow, there, there's, there's really, there must be some advent of quantum computing. And I think a lot of the recent interest and excitement has been incited by a tremendous amount of technology development. And even more than that, a tremendous amount of investment in quantum computing by large-scale companies like Google, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, etc. But it turns out, for those of you who maybe have been following this field a little bit longer than just the last couple of years, we might have to take a, a slight tour, detour to history. And this is not a very long, long ago history, certainly not the age of the universe. <laughs> but seven years ago, in sort of uh, starting into the summer, one would have found almost exactly the same headlines as one seen this summer. <laughs> Turns out that the first quantum computer was sold. The first sale for quantum computing, we have you know, commercially available quantum computers. 
So it's been seven years. Something must have happened in this intermediate time frame. Why exactly is there kind of a revitalization of the same exact headlines? And here's where one has to be a little bit cautious, I would say. So let's delve in a little bit into this history and into the machine that you see here, the so-called D-Wave 1. So I was, actually I have to say, I was pretty lucky to take a snapshot, a screenshot of the website, uh, the front page of D-Wave's website back in May of 2011. And this was the front page with the title, Yes, You Can Have One. So I mean, if you look exactly, you know, the person more or less shown to size. So I mean, you can have one, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit in your living room. But, you know, in principle, if you had an open floor plan, you know, so it's a, a little taller, a little taller chandelier, it could fit. It's not so wide across. It actually seems reasonable. One could imagine sort of fitting it there. Except for maybe, well, for, for some of us, two fundamental problems. The first is that it costs $10 million. <laughs> Although you notice that there is a buy it now card. <laughs> they, they quickly took that away. They, that did not survive long. But at the time, you could add one to your cart. I don't know exactly what kind of credit card you have to have to, to buy it, but you could at least add it to your cart. Excuse me, what are they selling? A speed? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll try to answer that's a very nuanced question, the focus of the next hour. But we will but hopefully we'll we'll be able to we'll be able to develop some feel for this. Awesome. Uh, and the second problem with this, uh, with this particular line is that it's not particularly clear whether or not there was anything quantum about this computer. So it's particular, it's purported to be a, a quantum computer, and it was purported to have 128 qubits. So let me define a piece of terminology now that will be very, very important as we go on. When we think about classical computers or information in general, we think about bits. And bits we think about as either in zero or one. The same fundamental building block underlies a quantum computer, except they're called quantum bits. And for short, they're referred to as qubits. So most of the time in our sort of uh, laptops these days, we think about the amount of memory in terms of gigabytes. A byte has eight bits, and a gigabyte has 10 to the nine bytes in it. So many, 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 many bits. Here, they're selling a much, much smaller quantum computer in principle, only 128 qubits, not clearly quantum bits at the moment, but they were purporting to, to make this commercially available. And of course, the, my favorite line here is, no, you are not dreaming. Ah, you know, it's not, it's not immediately clear. History, you know, as, as this field developed, we started to realize and question scientifically whether or not really there was anything underly quantum underlying the behavior of this machine. And I would say, even to this day, it's not super clear how much of the physics that underlies the architecture of the machine was truly quantum. And that being said, I wanted to show a picture. So here we have the sense that, well, you know, maybe you could fit one in your house if you had a slightly larger house. I wanted to show a picture taken from one of my good friends and close collaborators, Christopher Monroe, a professor at the University of Maryland. So this is an actual picture of his quantum computing laboratory. And the black arrow points to a very, very small vacuum chamber where there actually exists a string of about 70 individual ytterbium ions. Ytterbium is an element on the periodic table. And these are ytterbium ions shown one by one by one trapped above an electrode. So now we have a sense that, you know, and this is basically taken within the last year. So it turns out that in Chris's group at the moment, they have on the order of 10 times less working qubits, but in a system that's about 10 times larger than the purported D-Wave machine was back in 2011. So I think there really was a tremendous amount of skepticism at the time in terms of whether or not quantum computing was truly becoming commercial. And I still think that at the moment, as we can see from here, there's a ton of science to be done. I think we are all really, really optimistic about where this field will take us, but at the moment, I think one really has to figure out the technology, the engineering, the physics behind miniaturizing this to be able to actually have a working device, for example. But I think, you know, in some sense, looking forward, all is not lost. This picture doesn't look that different from the old ENIAC machine in 1946, right? The, the, the great granddaddy of our laptops today, and look how, how much progress has been made there.
So I think there really is a, a, a reason to be optimistic about the way that we can push forward in this field. So I've given a, a, at least a little bit of a historically cautious picture for sort of what quantum computing has been talked about, at least in, the, in, recent, uh, in recent news headlines. I'd like to start now by, uh, or even before, let me emphasize sort of what the current situation is. Again, sort of tempering our, our, our feelings a little bit. It turns out that right now there's a tremendous amount of different physical systems that people are thinking of utilizing to build quantum computers. There are circuits, electrical circuits. People imagine using, for example, certain defects in solids. People imagine using ions and atoms, for example. But one thing that I want to emphasize is the number here. So the number here basically summarizes the number of bits, the largest number of quantum bits that has been realized in these systems. I already mentioned that you know in our classical computer, we think of these numbers as gigabytes. Here you see the numbers are 9, in case you can't read it, I'll read it for you, 9, 14, 2, not available, and, uh, and 6. So it's clearly sort of, you know, we're still at the point where there's a lot of development in the technology that sort of has to happen. But one of the maybe overarching questions that I think is really important to ask is, what is the point of all of this technology? What is the reason why Google's investing $100 million into quantum computing? And the question there is, why would I want a quantum computer? So, in order to answer this question, we have to put on our computer scientist hats a little bit. So we have to get a little bit of a sense of what are the hard problems when we think about computers, you know, and we think about computer science. What exactly does it mean for a problem to be hard? And what exactly are the types of problems that one would want to solve using a computer that we cannot currently do upon our laptop? And there, the story is really about a notion called complexity. And I want to really break down this notion very, very slowly. If there's any questions, please just holler out. Instead of, so computer scientists, instead of thinking about just delineating whether a problem is hard or easy relative to how long it takes to solve the problem, they ask a question about scaling. And what I mean by scaling is, if I change or increase the size of a problem, how does the corresponding resource to solve this problem change. So let's work through a, a very, very simple example ourselves. Let's imagine that this sort of left-hand column represents the size of a given problem. And let's imagine the right-hand side over here represents the computational resource required to solve that problem. We can ask a very sharp question that computer scientists like to ask. What if I double the size of the problem? How exactly do the resources in order to solve this doubled in size problem scale with the size of the problem. And here, what I've shown is that in principle, we have, a, we have a, a problem that's doubled in size, and we have a resource that's also doubled in size. And if you can imagine that, uh, I've put an n here, you can imagine that if I take this problem and I multiply it by a factor of n, or make it n times larger, that you could have a solution that would take a resource that's also n times larger. Somehow that feels very, very intuitive to us. And it turns out, this type of scaling, one last piece of jargon for ourselves, is known as polynomial scaling. So polynomial means that the problem size, for example, scales somewhat linearly with the size of the, uh, the resource size scales somewhat linearly with the size of the problem. And this should be contrasted with, I'll put it here, but I'll give a very, very clear intuition for what this means in a second. This type of scaling should be contrasted with what computer scientists think of as hard problems. And those hard problems, what they mean by that is that, in fact, the scaling of the resources with the problem size is exponential. So that means scaling at something is e to the n. For those that don't have a good feeling about exactly what e to the n means, we will, we will hopefully give you a feeling in just a few slides. Excuse me. Yeah. The resources you mean by the, what kind of? Time, for example. So if I, if I take the same, so time and energy, so usually, you know, your computer is drawing more or less the same amount of power over a constant period of time, so time and energy. But time is the easiest thing to think about. If I have a problem of size A, and I want to double that problem size, maybe for most of the problems that we're familiar with, it takes two times as long, for example, to get the answer to that problem. It's a very good question, thank you. So let's work through an example together a little bit. So it turns out that, uh, as is being suggested, we're all really 
pretty good at identifying problems that have this particular scaling property. So if we harken back to our uh, elementary school days, it turns out that this set of problems, which have solutions whose uh, size scales directly with the resources required to solve them, is known as polynomial, and that's exactly the classification P when people and computer scientists say this problem is in the class P. And so it turns out that uh, we know lots of these examples. So the sorting of a list, take a, an unsorted list of elements, unsorted list of numbers, and sort them. That's in the class P. Add two numbers. That's in the class P. Multiply two numbers, also in the class P. So now let's do a, a little bit of exploration together and try to get a sense of what exactly we mean when we say we talk about scalings of problems. So as an example, let's take two things that are kind of the inverse of each other, but that should all be very, very familiar to us. Multiplication, we're very familiar, 3 times 5 is 15. On the other hand, factoring is sort of the inverse of multiplication, but we're also typically pretty familiar with that. So if one asks, for example, someone to factor the number 21, none of us would have a problem with that. We'd say that the factors of 21 are 3 and 7, because 3 times 7 equals 21. Right, so these are sort of very, very simple inversions of each other. And it turns out, so I've been giving sort of single digit examples of this, but of course your computer is way more powerful than that. It can do multiplication of much, much larger numbers. And it can do also factorization of much, much larger numbers. So it turns out that multiplying two 30 digit computers, the 30 digit numbers, excuse me, on a sort of a more or less gigahertz type processor that we have these days, takes a very, very short amount of time, well less than a millisecond, or one one-thousandth of a second. In the same way, factoring a 30-digit number also is very, very quick, takes the same amount of time, more or less, less than one millisecond. But we can now ask the computer science version of this question to get a sense of what it means when we think about scaling a problem and asking about complexity. We can ask ourselves the question, how long does it take to multiply two 300-digit numbers? Certainly for a laptop, it's going to take longer than multiply two 30-digit numbers, but turns out it takes well less than a second. So the first interactive piece of my talk is, can people give me a rough estimate, sort of within a factor of 10? What exactly do you think is the time scale it takes for a computer, my laptop for example, to factor a 300-digit number? The same less than one second? We have less than one second. You know, going once, uh, any other buyers? What, what, what are we thinking? I expect it's more than that, but I have no idea within several. So why do you expect it more? Because there are more possibilities in a larger number. Right? Uh, interesting. Okay, so we're already talking about possibilities. I like where this is going. So we have, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> one more time? Heat death of the universe. The heat death of the universe. That's okay. That's an interesting one. We'll stick with less than one second for now. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll, we'll see what, where it goes from there. So it turns out uh, that would be the most well-spent one second of your life ever. Because it turns out there is a, a company out there known, um, which puts out a challenge known as the RSA Factoring Challenge. And this company has numbers of a certain length of digits, so in this case 100 digits, 110, just like the number 30 digits or 300 digits I was giving puts those numbers out, it knows what the factors of that number are, and it's asking you as a challenge to factor them. And most importantly, it offers large cash prizes. So it turns out that uh, up to today, um, people have factored numbers that are approximately 220 digits long. But it turns out that there are a number of unclaimed prizes if one of us could do this, I'd, I'd happily share the prize with you. So it turns out that for a 300-digit number, they will offer you $100,000 if you can factor that number. And if you just double the size of this number, right? I mean, if you scale, if, it, if things scale polynomially, that shouldn't be that much harder. If you factor a 600-digit number, they offer $200,000. But at the moment, both of these prizes are unclaimed. And the origin of that is exactly this notion of an exponentially hard problem. So even though when we went from multiplying two 30-digit numbers, the time scale only changed a very, very small amount, 
When we ask about factorization, it turns out the time scale gets exponentially enhanced and now it becomes, in fact, astronomical. So uh, the answer was not so, so far off, the heat wow. death of the universe. It turns out that in order to factor a 300 digit number with our current computational resources, it would take nearly 150,000 years. We'd all be dinosaurs by that time. <laughs> Laptop or the crayon? Uh, we're talking more, yeah, we're talking a, a solid, you know, laptop that one could buy by these days. Mm -hmm. And even with, you know, even with like a supercomputer at this stage, it would still be sort of, you know, you know, a hundred, a thousand years, for example. It would not, it would not be able to change much more than that. The take-home message of this slide, one second, the take-home message of this slide is exponentials are a doozy. So it turns out that when you have an exponentially hard problem, just changing the problem size a little bit means that the resources required to solve this problem get much, much larger. Please. Well, what am I missing if I think that two can be a factor and it wouldn't be that tough to find the other one? Yeah, so, so for an odd number, two is not a factor. But the point that was sort of alluded to actually very, very nicely here is you have a very, very large number. You say, well, two is, you know, you say, okay, well, if I cut the number in half, I could see whether or not two is a factor. Then I could cut it in a third and see whether or not three is a factor. And you basically have to keep going and looking at all of these different combinations of numbers. And going through that set of combinations is very, very difficult because you are you have an exponentially large sp space of combinations to look at. On the other hand, when you have multiplication, you have two definite numbers. They're given to you with a specific operation. There is none of this sort of you know ambiguity and uncertainty that comes with factoring. And that's the essence of why it's much harder. Good. So it turns out that the maybe maybe the most amazing fact in all of quantum computing is that in the same way that multiplication is easy for a classical computer like my laptop, and in the same way that we largely believe factoring to be extremely hard for a classical computer like my laptop, it turns out that factoring is easy for a quantum computer. So a quantum computer can take that exponential scaling down to a polynomial scaling. And that is a sort of very, very remarkable feature of this intuition that quantum computers can do more than classical computers can do. And the first time this algorithm was, uh, was introduced was by Peter Shore, a professor at MIT, um, over 20 years ago in 1994. But what we'll see as we sort of move on is, despite sort of this tremendous power that I'm sort of giving you a feeling of, it's not really clear how many problems there are that really live in the venue like factoring, for example. How many problems there are that quantum computing can really allow for an exponential speed up. So maybe the two, one more take home message as we continue here. So I've talked about the classification P, which is the class of problems that are easy for classical computers like my laptop to solve. I haven't defined it yet, but computer scientists love acronyms. It turns out that the class of problems that provably a quantum computer can also solve easily, those that scale polynomially with the size of the problem, live in a class called BQP. Going back to classical computers, one thing I want to emphasize is that there are hard problems. So factoring was one example of them. I've already explained this. So we have a good feeling that classical computers, our laptop, cannot do everything. That class of problems lives in a class called NP. But the most important take-home message from this section of the talk is that there are hard problems even with quantum computers. And that's what I wanted to emphasize, that factoring is rather than sort of a, a classic example that's you know similar to all the other examples, is really a one in a million example where one can see the power of quantum computing giving an exponential advancement over a classical computer. Largely speaking, we do not believe that quantum computers can solve the majority of the hard problems that we're interested in for classical computation. The majority of the sort of uh, class of problems that are sort of even more difficult than factoring, for example, we do not believe that quantum computers are able to do this. So does P stand for possible and NP for not possible? That's pretty, pretty close, actually. P stands for polynomial, and NP, everyone thinks, stands for not polynomial. 
but it stands for non-deterministic polynomial. I'm sorry. Um, it turns out there's an amazing proof in computer science that explains that um, NP sort of, you know, the class of problems that you can check the answer very quickly are more or less the class of problems NP. So let's take factoring in this example. I give Tucker a really big 300 digit number. He factors it, gives me 50K because I gave him the number. And, uh, and after he factors it, I know that I can multiply the numbers really easy. So it's hard to come up with a solution, but it's darn easy to check the solution. So NP is sort of that type of a class of problems. And it stands for, yes, more or less the class of problems that are very difficult to solve on a classical computer. Good. So with this caveat in mind, let's push forward a little bit and ask ourselves a second important question. Maybe this is the uh, a second thing I'd really, really like everyone to get a sense of, just an intuition or a feeling for why this is the case. How exactly, for, for example, this very, very specific problem, how exactly does a quantum computer outperform my laptop? What exactly is the essential physics? What's the insight that allows a quantum computer to do better? Even if it's just in factoring, which is the only example we've done at the moment, how exactly is it able to do better? It turns out, uh, before we walk down this path, I want to, I want to start with uh, one of my favorite quotes from a uh, Nobel Prize winner in 1997, the same year as the inception of Wonderfest, uh, Bill Phillips, a professor uh, also at the University of Maryland and the Joint Quantum Institute. Uh, Bill likes to say, a quantum computer differs more from a classical computer than a classical computer differs from an abacus. <laughs> Just to give a sense of sort of, you know, where we're, where we're heading. And I think, actually, I would agree with Bill. So it seems like a very, very sort of landmark statement. But in fact, it's not so hard to understand why. In some sense, both a classical computer and abacus are governed by the same fundamental laws of nature. They're governed by the laws that Newton understood way back when. On the other hand, the fundamental underlines of a quantum computer are governed by quantum mechanics. And in order to really get a sense of how exactly a quantum computer can outperform a classical computer, we have to take a little foray into understanding what I like to call the two golden rules of quantum mechanics. Rule number one. As you're all going to be quantum mechanics experts after this. Rule number one. Quantum objects are waves and can be in superposition. Uh, let's let that settle in a little bit. So usually when we think of a classical bit, we usually think of a state being either zero or one. And the key is the emphasis on the word or. So we have sort of a classical bit. It's either in zero or one. It can be sort of one or the other. We can flip it from zero to one, but it cannot be in both states at the same time. On the other hand, one of the fundamental uh, surprises that quantum mechanics has introduced to us is really the fact that at the very, very small length scales, it turns out that quantum mechanical objects can be in a superposition. This means they can be both in a state of zero and one. The classic example that you've probably all heard of is Schrodinger's cat, which thinks, you know, posits the possibility of a, a live or dead cat depending on sort of whether a vial of cyanide has been shattered by a radioactive atom. It turns out that in this case, we can imagine uh, a much simpler object, just a zero or one. Classically, we know it's either or. And in quantum mechanics, we usually write down the state of the quantum bit as a superposition, hence the plus sign between zero and one. The second, and, and maybe the, the, the simplest analogy that one can think of is a wave on a string. So for example, we can imagine Tucker and I shaking a standing wave on a string. We can imagine adding another wave onto the string. And what would happen is we would find beating patterns. So neither of the waves sort of don't exist anymore. They've added and they're now in superposition with each other. And this is kind of an underlying idea of the wave particle duality of quantum mechanics that allows for objects like qubits to be in a quantum superposition. Rule number two. Rule number one holds as long as you don't look. <laughs> and it turns out when you do look, it no longer holds. So when you do look, and what I mean by look is you make a measurement on the system, it turns out that the system now collapses, and that's, that is the technical term, it collapses into the, either the state zero or the state one. And it does so probabilistically. 
So for example, if you prepare the same quantum state many, many, many times, and you run an experiment where you measure this state many, many times after you prepare it in the same exact way, you'll find that with some probability p, you'll get the answer 0, and with some probability 1 minus p, you'll get the answer 1. Okay. So there's some aspect of non-determinism or probabilisticness built into the notions of quantum mechanics. Yeah, please. What's the symbol that looks like a, an arrow? Okay. This one. No, not the feet, but the, the arrowy thing. It's, yeah. it's after the zero. After the zero. After the zero. Yeah. Ah, yes, sorry, okay. So that is, uh, that's what's known as a ket in quantum mechanics. K-E-T? K-E-T, exactly. So it turns out, okay, that is a little bit interesting. So imagine something that looks like this, you would call a bracket, right? Yes. So it turns out that this half of it people call a bra. And this half people oh. call a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out it turns out that all that means, you know, it's uh, we like to write a sort of a, a zero and a one in, for example, this cat notation to really clearly emphasize that it's a quantum state and not a classical state. In classical states, we usually just write a zero or one. Good question. So. You already, from these two rules, can get a sense, a little bit of a sense of the feeling of one, where the power of quantum mechanics lies, and two, where its limitations lie as well. So it turns out the good news should already be kind of apparent to you. The fact that I'm allowed to have superpositions of states is so tremendously powerful. Let me give an example. So if I imagine having three, a very small number of quantum bits, it turns out that I have, in terms of the possibilities for these bits, I could have them in all in the zero state, two in the zero state, one in the one state, the second one in the one state, and the first and third in the zero state, and so on. And it turns out, in general, for n quantum bits, there are two to the n such states that are allowed. So in this case, two to the three, two to the power of three is two times two times two is eight. And I've enumerated for you the eight possible quantum states that can be allowed by this three quantum bit system. And it turns out the essence of sort of superposition means that as an input, I can have somehow a fraction of all of these states inputted into a calculation. On the other hand, for a classical computer, if we have a classical memory, it can only be in any one of these states. So you see already somehow the input has this exponential complexity on top of normal classical computers, what normally happens in our laptop. So that's good. That's rule number one in action. Turns out there's also bad news. Measurements give you random junk. So, you know, you know that it's only probabilistic. You measure it once, you get out one answer, you measure it the second time, you get a different answer. How do I know what the right answer is, actually? And it turns out that, amazingly, one has the ability to utilize quantum mechanics and the phenomenon of interference to be able to overcome this challenge, the challenge of rule number two. And the idea there was uh, originated by a really, in a really tremendously beautiful paper by David Deutsch in the early 1990s, where he showed that despite the fact that in principle one should get a random result, one can do a circuit or a complex arrangement of interactions between these different quantum bits that allows for the right solution or the solution you're looking for to interfere constructively and for the wrong solution to interfere destructively. So in the same way that you imagine having water waves, for example, if you have two water waves where the crests are the troughs and the troughs are the crests, you can imagine them inter interacting destructively, so they would sort of cancel each other out. But you can also imagine two waves where the crests overlap with another crest and the trough overlaps with another trough, and this would lead to an enhancement of that wave. And this idea of interference is the essence of what allows one to get out a useful result despite the fact that in principle one has an intrinsic aspect of randomness built into quantum mechanics. So it seems pretty rosy at the moment. I said there was, you know, you've now learned all of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that uh, some pieces are good, some pieces are bad, but it seems like we can overcome the challenges. So one can go back to our original discussion that we started this off with and ask ourselves, this seems pretty powerful, so what are some other applications? 
The application I already mentioned is the ability to use a quantum computer to factor large numbers. And there, we get an enhancement in the scaling complexity of the problem from an exponential complexity to a polynomial complexity. And this is particularly important in cryptography. So it turns out that at the moment, much of public key cryptography, also basically how credit card transactions are encrypted at the moment, which may not be super good, but uh, public key cryptography relies upon the inability to factor large numbers. So you can imagine somehow that, you know, Tucker and I are trying to share a secret. We each have a large number, and we also know, for example, so we know how to multiply that number very easily. And if we have a code that is the multiplication of these two numbers, and we pass some information encoded as a cipher using the multiplication of these two numbers, any intermediate person that intercepts that message has a very hard time decoding it because they don't know how to factor. But then on the other hand, either one of us knows how to knows how to decipher the message because we can take the large number divided by our own number and immediately get the other person's secret number. Right? So it turns out that uh, the next, I would say, most important, I think, is, is a reasonable word, although people may differ um, in opinions on me, with me when I say this. Another particularly important application is in search. So you can imagine, and this is uh, a problem that Google is very, very interested in. You can imagine searching through an unsorted database. Classic example, given a phone number, find the owner's name in a phone book. So the classical strategy that you, know, you or I would have to do that there's no better way. I mean, you may, you, M might be your favorite letter, so you might start there. But on average, you're going to have to go through every single name within that phone book before you sort of find the right one. On the other hand, it turns out that one can prove, and this is a, a beautiful algorithm proved by Love Grover, known as Grover's search algorithm in uh, 1997, that a quantum computer can find uh, such an entry in an unsorted database quadratically faster than a classical computer. Let me emphasize what that means, quadratically. So it's not the same as exponentially, which is what we learned about for quantum factoring. Quadratically means that the scaling originally starts off as n. It's not an exponentially hard problem to start with, but it gets even easier on a quantum computer. And in particular, the scaling n goes to square root of n. So you might say that for a quantum computer, if one was searching through, let's say, a million names in a phone book, it would be approximately as hard as if a classical computer was searching through a thousand names. So we take the square root of a million to get a thousand, and that basically tells us how much easier it is. So it turns out that is a much, much, much weaker result than the exponential enhancement that one gets for factoring. But it's also one of particular importance in some sense, because searching through unsorted database is something that we're all extremely interested in, especially now that we're sort of in the age of big data, where there's so much data available, finding useful structure within this data, I think will be a very, very powerful application of such quantum devices. And you might say, okay, well, you know, Norm, give us more of a list. What are the other problems that quantum computers are good for? It's kind of it. So there are, there are other quantum algorithms that exist out there, but it turns out that most of them rely upon the same underlying physics that allows for solutions to quantum factory and quantum search. So it really does not allow us to solve a much broader class of problems. This is something I want to emphasize again that I already emphasized um, at the end of the last section. It turns out that maybe the most important take home message is that quantum computers are not expected, and by not expected, I mean I would really bet, I don't know, that's why I like a hand, I'm not, not even an arm, but a hand on the fact that, that they are really not expected to be able to solve what are known as NP complete problems. These are the hardest class of classical problems that exist. They're classes of problems that are actually more difficult than factoring, and these are the problems that really classical computer scientists would really love efficient polynomial time solutions for, and it turns out quantum computers are largely believed not to be able to do this. Please. I have a question back at satisfiability. I don't understand the term in the context of the... Yeah, sorry. So satisfiability, it's, 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 it's all I'm trying to say, for example, I'm trying to find uh, and the owner's name, which satisfies the fact that his phone number equals my phone number. 
It's just, uh, yeah, sorry, that was a slightly more jargony thing for something that's actually very simple. <clears throat> Please. What's the example of an MP3 problem? Yeah, so, sorry? That's exactly an example of it, is a tra traveling salesman problem, that's right. So for those that are unfamiliar, you can uh, ask this particular question, which is, uh, imagine that you have sort of, you know, end cities. And I am a, a newspaper salesman, and I want to be able to, on a, on a random graph in America, and I want to be able to figure out the path which traverses all of the cities exactly once that has the shortest overall distance. A very important problem that UPS would love to solve, but a problem that's tremendously difficult. And it's those types of problems that are super important, but that it's largely believed that quantum computers are not going to be able to solve. Great example. Please. Quantum computers basically work with numbers, and they don't deal with word problems. I mean, you know. No. So, 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 so. Let me, let me, let me try. So, at the end of the day, in some broad sense, all computers deal with numbers. So, at the end of the day, you know, when we, when we take, you know, when I type out, you know, the word Tucker, or the word Thomas, or something like that, at the end, the computer is still translating it to the language of bits. So, quantum computers work with quantum bits that have a slightly more non-trivial structure than numbers themselves. There's some notion of superposition. They really live in a mathematical object known as a vector space. And it turns out that, but at the core, I think the distinction between maybe numbers and letters is not quite the right one, but really between classical bits and quantum bits. And that distinction of superposition is the one that I think is, is really important. Sorry, what, there was a question. How long is uh, classical uh, computation solving the end? Yeah, so in some sense, classical computers and quantum computers are in the same boat there. So we don't know how to solve uh, the traveling salesman problem on a classical computer, but this has been known for a long time. But at the same time, what I'm emphasizing is that even with a quantum computer, nominally a more, much more powerful machine, I'm trying to emphasize that it's kind of specially more powerful, that there are certain problems where it really can enable large advancements, but for other problems like the traveling sales problem, I would say that your laptop is just as good as a $10 million quantum computer. And uh, when you're comparing two, uh, two computation uh, algorithms, uh, no, not exactly, math, math I say, do, you do they use the same type of algorithm mathematically? Or no, 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 very different, okay. very different, because at the core, in a quantum computer wants to be able to make use of this idea of superposition. So the algorithm that it's sort of building in, even the basic building blocks, which are able to be superpositions, are going to be different than the classical ones. So for example, the algorithm for factoring, Shor's algorithm, looks very, very, very different than the best classical algorithm known to factor. Is there a set of scientists who are putting their backs on quantum computing in order to devise a different way of going to the traveling salesman? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting question. So I can, I can, okay, well, let me, let me answer it very honestly. I would say, in some sense, that's all of us. We'd all, we're all thinking about, you know, yeah, okay, so it, we're all thinking about trying to improve algorithms that would solve these types of problems, but we're not doing so, I think, at, a, as a, at an honest level, we're, we're not pushing very hard on this because it's just believed to be really, really not true. So it's something like, you know, it's like some, it's some idea, you know, it's like, uh, let's say, what's a good example of this? It's an idea that you don't believe is true, but maybe because it's kind of cool, like, oh God, this is probably going to be a really bad example, I'm sorry. I don't believe the earth is flat, but I don't know, maybe, oh, that's a terrible example, let me, let me, let me, let me take that, let's, let's not do that. No, but there's an idea, you know, there's a deep set feeling, I can't explain it to you, but there's a deep set feeling that quantum computers cannot solve the traveling salesman problem. But at the same time, I go to the bathroom, well, maybe there's a, maybe there's an idea here. I just had a good one. Maybe I'll work it out a little bit. But at the core, sort of, since the vast majority of the field on very, very good technical grounds don't believe this to be true, I think nobody's really spending a tremendous amount of effort. Although every once in a while, you'll have a deja vu moment where you're like, oh, maybe this will work, and you'll probably quickly convince yourself that it doesn't. Please. Um. Perhaps you must be familiar a lot more than me, but I seem to recall hearing something about a, a research project with what they were characterizing as like a biological computer with like involving the Japanese subway and it was like a mold colony or something. 
that ring a bell? Okay, so I, I know. Okay, so I, I don't know about that particular example. But I can, the, the mold colony, like there was like in the incentive of them finding a food source, and somehow and they, the most efficient they use the yeah exactly it optimized the efficiency of the system. So it's certainly possible. So one thing that people are thinking about these days are do quantum effects like superposition underlie some biological principles? And and honestly, that feels very natural, right? Because you think well. Okay, if we believe Darwinian evolution, we should be, in some principle, sort of using all of the resources at hand. Nature at the nanoscale is extremely quantum mechanical. How is it not clear that sort of, uh, that biological systems should be able to harness the laws of quantum mechanics to be able to do better, given that that might lead to an evolutionary advantage? A very, very natural thought. I think that is a natural thought, but it's not clear anywhere, I think, that that's been proven, I would say. So there are conjectures out there, people claim to have some data maybe, oh, showing that this looks to be good. So the classic example, maybe even before this mold colony that I don't know about, is photosynthesis. So in general, we've been trying to make really good solar cells that are very efficient for a long time. Turns out plants are way better at that than us. So what exactly are plants doing that we're not doing? Well, maybe they're harnessing quantum mechanics in some way that we're not harnessing. People say these words, and there's a tremendous amount of interest in them, and I myself is very is, am very interested in this, but I would say that at the sci on scientific grounds, there's no clear evidence that photosynthesis nor any other biological process at the moment has been proven to utilize or harness quantum correlations. Please. The scientific basis that the emotion of Pluto was a planet 12 to 15 years ago better explained by quantum computers or by modern-day laptops. Sorry, sorry, one more time, one more time. The scientific basis of the devotion of Pluto as a uh -huh. planet uh -huh. 12 to 15 years ago better explained by quantum computers or Modern day, uh, modern day laptops explained very well in fact without modern day laptops by Newton back in the day so it's actually you no know, that's the type of thing where you have a very macroscopic object where the laws are really very very classical it's only when you get to very very small objects that we can think of the dynamics the motion of these small objects as being characterized much better by quantum mechanics great question please any impact on artificial intelligence by quantum yeah, another very, very interesting question. So um, the answer is not clear, but I can tell you what I think. It has to probably stay in this room, but OK. So, so it turns out there's a, there's a tremendously, uh, yeah, I think large group of people these days thinking about the interplay between quantum mechanics and machine learning. So machine learning, you know, artificial intelligence, this idea that, you know, for example, you know, Google's AlphaGo being able to beat Lee Seydal in the, in the classic game of Go, for example, you know, Deep Blue back in 97 when IBM beat Gary Kasparov. All of these are some idea that computers basically can take a problem that feels very human and very anthropomorphic and maybe do it better. Right? It turns out that I do think, broadly speaking, given the fact that you have the ability to look through many, many inputs at the same time, you can imagine looking through many chess positions at the same time, many go positions at the same time with a more complex input, that I think probably there is some way where quantum mechanics should be able to help improve machine learning, where it can harness the quantum, quantum superpositions, for example, to improve upon the performance, but it's not clear how to do that. And the key problem, actually, to start off, is how do you encode classical information like a chess position into a quantum state. That's something nobody thinks about and very few people are working on. We like to work on quantum algorithms where we have a quantum state, we do a computation on it and get an answer. But if we're interested in asking about classical questions, we better darn well know how to convert a classical question into a quantum state. That's a field, if you go Google it, it's known as QRAM or quantum RAM. And I think it hasn't gotten popular yet, but I do think it's one of the most important obstacles facing the translation of sort of classical questions into quantum questions. Great, great questions, fantastic. So let's continue. It turns out, so what I'm trying to emphasize here is that you know quantum computers are tremendously powerful in some senses, but they're much more niche objects than sort of broad-scale computational objects that can solve any task whatsoever. 
And it turns out that um, one might think, going back to this question about biology actually, that perhaps the most useful thing that a quantum computer can do is to perform a simulation of nature's processes, which we know are at the nanoscale intrinsically quantum mechanical. And this, uh, with the ever prescient Richard Feynman had a wonderful quote in 1981 that I'll just read aloud. Nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Hmm. And this is really encapsulated by the question that was asked, actually, sort of that was bounced back and forth here. So, in principle, we know that nature at very small scales is quantum mechanical. And we know that it's very, very hard for us to describe quantum mechanics. So having a general purpose quantum computer would allow us, for example, to simulate photosynthesis and allow us to tweak the elements of photosynthesis to figure out what pieces of quantum mechanics are really coming in, if any. So I think that even more broad than the set of questions that we're interested in at the classical world on a day-to-day -day level, traveling salesman problems, searching through an unsorted list, factoring, what may be kind of the most probable place where quantum computers leave a lasting mark on society, in my opinion, is actually in the simulation and understanding of complex phenomena that occur in nature. Understanding superconductivity, understanding photosynthesis, understanding at the nanoscale how chemical reactions work, how the orientation of different molecules affects the reactivity of a certain chemical reagent. Good. So that sort of uh, maybe goes through kind of my second piece, which is to give you a sense of how the rules of quantum mechanics enable one to do a better, better computation. And the last, uh, the last section that I want to go through is just to give a very, very broad sense. You know, it's a very, very large scale. There's a lot of answers out there. But let me emphasize three ways that people are currently using in the laboratory to make quantum bits. So what actually are these quantum bits that sort of exist in the laboratory at the moment? The first and most classic one are individual atoms and ions. And in some sense, they really are nature's quantum bit. So it turns out that we could imagine an atom. An atom, for example, has electrons. We think about an atom having a nuclei that consists of, uh, that consists of protons, neutrons, but also it has electrons. And it turns out that one can utilize different states of the spin, the quantum mechanical spin of this electron as the basis for a quantum bit. Easy way to think about this, at least at a at a picture picture level, is to think about the spin as a little magnet. And depending on whether the spin's pointing north to south or south to north, that defines the two states of this quantum bit of a single atom. It turns out that atoms really in some sense make impeccable qubits. They are fundamentally quantum, they're very small. They're inherently identical. Every carbon atom is the same as every other carbon atom. And they exhibit, for example, long coherence times where it can store quantum information extremely well. On the other hand, one doesn't typically just have in one's hand a single atom. It makes them very, very hard to work with because they are so small. Turns out the dominant way that people work with atoms is to use laser light to trap the atoms in a vacuum chamber. But ultimately, this type of process is difficult because it requires very, very low temperatures and very, very small nanoscale control of a system. So certainly lots of advantages, but also some drawbacks. To this end, sort of people have also been trying to create artificial atoms. And the one I would say that is dominating the current market, for example, it's Google's effort, IBM's effort, and Intel's effort, although uh, Microsoft, the other sort of big, um, big contributor to these worldwide efforts, is, is working in a totally different direction, are artificial atoms made out of circuits. And the idea is very, very simple. You can imagine the quantum bit being stored inside a very, very small electrical circuit. And you can imagine that if the electrons or the current is flowing clockwise, that's one of the quantum states, zero in a ket. And if the current is flowing clockwise, that's another quantum state, the one that would be in the ket. And when you have these very, very small nanoscale electronic circuits, we can make superpositions of currents going in both directions. Turns out that uh, in the laboratory, it doesn't look so quite so elegant, but it still looks pretty, pretty good. 
Most importantly, it turns out this micron scale is starting to get to the point where you can feel it. You know, it's the kind of width of a thin strand of hair, which certainly we could see. It turns out that when one builds a larger circuit, it's something that one can, can hold in one's hand. It's no longer as nanoscale as a single atom or as a single ion. And this needs, uh, leads to a, a very, very powerful advantage, is that one no longer needs to use lasers to trap the qubit. It just sits there by itself. One, moreover, can harness, because one's building circuits, all of the infrastructure and technology that's been developed for the last 30 years, since the advent or 40 years after the transistor, on semiconductor integrated circuits. Of course, a disadvantage is that because we are fabricating these circuits, every circuit is different. And this means that every qubit is different. And these differences make for challenges in making the qubits talk to one another. At the moment, we're mainly only talking about individual incarnations of qubits, but at the end, when we want to do a computation, these various qubits must talk to each other. There must be some sort of logic that's performed in order to do a complex computation. And it turns out that, uh, that when every qubit is different, it makes this type of interaction much, much more challenging. Uh, and another disadvantage, not so dissimilar to the atomic or ionic case, is that it still requires very, very low temperatures, millikelvin temperatures. The last class of artificial atoms, uh, very different than electrical circuits, um, and the particular system that we work with in my laboratory, are defects in solid materials. So, ending very shortly. Uh, defects in solid materials. The, the material we work with in diamond, uh, we work with is diamond. So diamond, natively, all of you know, is a lattice, a perfect lattice of carbon atoms. And the lattice of carbon atoms is arranged in a tetrahedral way. So every carbon atom is connected to four other carbon atoms because it has four valence electrons, right? So it turns out that uh, although we think of diamond as a perfect material, there are naturally defects in diamond. And two of the most common defects are when a single carbon atom is substituted by a nitrogen atom, which is one over on the periodic table. So it's hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen. So one over on the periodic table. And another extremely common defect is a vacant lattice site, a lattice site where there simply is no carbon at all. And it turns out that when these two defects are adjacent to one another, it turns out that they behave very, very similar to an artificial atom trapped inside the diamond lattice. You can think about this, I mean, it basically looks like an atom nitrogen kind of living in this space made by the vacancy, but it's no longer trapped by lasers, it's trapped inside the diamond lattice itself. Turns out this is exactly the system that Thomas is, is working on in the laboratory. And uh, here's a, a picture of what the experiments look like, just to give you a sense. So it's hard to see over here, but there's a chunk of diamond. So we don't, we don't use gem diamonds, actually. We use diamonds that are very specifically tailored to these quantum phenomena that we're interested in. So in the absence of light, it's hard to see, I know, uh, the, and if you, if you took it out and looked at it, it'd basically be black and opaque, more or less. But it turns out if you shine, actually this laser pointer is a good example, if you shine green light onto this particular sample of diamond, it fluoresces a very, very deep red. And this red fluorescence is exactly the fact that the electronic spins of these defects in diamond are responding to your laser. And that's actually evidence, particular evidence, of the fact that there are these quantum mechanical defects inside the system. So if you have a non-defected diamond, that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. Exactly right. If you, have non, if you have no defects in diamond, this would not happen. Please. What conditions create the N and the V? Great question. Uh, probably more detail than most of you want to hear, but she asked the question. So it turns out that what you know, if one takes a sort of a, a perfect diamond lattice, one can create uh, these particular defects using a two-step process. The first step is one takes nitrogen gas, N2 gas, and shoots it very fast at the sample. And this actually creates many, many, many substitutional impurities, so nitrogens that substitute carbons. But that's only half of the defect, where's the vacancy? Then, one typically takes a sample and heats it up approximately, I would say, 1,000 degrees Celsius. And what happens is then, because of the thermal energy, the, the diamond lattice is vibrating very, very quickly. And these vibrations actually allow for vacant lattice sites to move around. 
And it turns out that when a vacant lattice finds a nitrogen atom, it's just slightly lower in energy than when a carbon atom sits next to a vacant lattice And the reason is because nitrogen is one over on the periodic table, so it's a little bit larger. And that additional strain energy, the energy for the ability of the nitrogen's larger size to be compensated by the vacancy, is what leads to it being a little bit more stable. That's a great explanation. Uh, very good. Should come more often. <laughs> <laughs> All of my talks. So it turns out that the key advantage here um, is that uh, it's able to operate at room temperature. Unlike the previous two systems, it does not require very, very low temperatures where you have a particular a tremendous amount of infrastructure that needs to be built around it. A disadvantage is that the process that I just explained is probabilistic. You never know, as I said, the vacancy sort of moving around and hopping around, you never know whether a particular nitrogen will get a vacancy attached to it or it won't. So it's hard to imagine sort of making a deterministic statement. I want an envy center here. It's hard to create an envy center at the location that one would, one would desire. Finally, let me end on uh, just two very, very quick slides, sort of maybe looking forward. And in order to look forward, at the moment, I've emphasized talking about the building block and infrastructure, which are single quantum bits. But as I said, to do a computation, we need to make these qubits interact with one another. In the language of classical computer science, the way classical bits talk to one another are via gates. So we have things where you can do logic between two qubits, and here's a truth table. So you can do an AND gate, which, for example, basically adds the information in two bits, mod 2. Um, oh no, so adds uh, the information in the sense that if both the bits are 1, it, the output is also 1, sort of a particular gate. In the same way, on a quantum computer, we also have quantum gates that allow for interactions between two quantum bits. And the real benchmark, and this is uh, the take-home message here, for where we want to be and where we're going is a combination of not just the number of qubits in a system, but also the number of gates that one can perform in such a system. And here's an example, another slide from my, uh, my colleague and friend Chris Monroe about a particular um, apparatus, a particular platform known as uh, atomic ions. You can see here, for example, that there is uh, many, many different examples where we have on the order of, let's say, 10 qubits or so, 10 quantum bits or so, with between 100 and 1,000 gates. It turns out that all of these types of systems that have been built up are still much, much weaker than our classical computer. And it's only after getting to a number of quantum bits and a number of gates that's, I would say, on the order of 100 quantum bits, can we really say that the quantum computer is doing something, anything, that a classical computer could not do. Recently, that's been going under the moniker of, of quantum supremacy, although I think that really the correct language is something more like a quantum advantage, demonstrating that there's been a quantum advantage over classical behavior. You can see that, you know, I think hopefully by the end of this year, people are thinking that we'll be able to have tens of quantum bits Maybe at the end of sort of next year, we'll slowly start to get to the threshold where we can really say that we're reaching the regime where a quantum computer or a quantum device is doing something that in principle a classical device might not be able to do, irregardless of whether it's useful in solving certain problems yet or algorithmically useful for problems, at least it's doing something that a classical computer would not easily be able to accomplish. With that in mind, two final take-home messages. The first Given, I mean, I think that all of these recent investments and the, the various systems that people are pushing on are all leading us down the right path. I would, uh, I would venture and tender cautious optimism, but my personal perspective is that we're still in the regime of science, where there's a tremendous amount of physics and basic science research to be done before we actually figure out what the right path to commercialization and technology development and engineering really is. And the second take-home message is the answer to what can they do. Examples like factoring, which you may hear about a lot and read about a lot in all of these news articles, are amazing and brilliant, but also few and far between. On the other hand, 
In some sense, perhaps one of the most powerful uses of a quantum computer will be to simulate and understand natural phenomena that we're not able to capture and simulate on our classical computers because of the limitations of classical mechanics and because the behavior of these different types of phenomena may be intrinsically quantum mechanical. With that, uh, I want to end by, by, by thanking, despite the fact that I didn't talk about much of our own research, by thanking the people in my group who really um, make you know going to Cal every day just a, a tremendously amazing experience. Some of the stuff work that I described, especially on the experiments with defects in diamond done by Thomas, Satcher, Pra, and my postdoc, Chong Zhu. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for your questions and, and attention. Thank you.